Every heart, oh God, that has come, oh God, ready to worship, oh God, let your spirit, oh God, have free reign, oh God, throughout this planet, oh God. For Lord, we know, oh God, that you are the only God that is worth praising, oh God. Lord, all praise is due to your name, oh God. Those that are sick, those that are hungry, oh God, those, oh God, that are thirsty, Lord, we ask that you'll meet them at the point of their need, oh God, and that you'll let your spirit, oh God, oh God, even fulfill, oh God, that which we have said, oh God, of the years, oh God. Lord Jesus, we glorify you, we praise you, we magnify you, we worship you, oh God. But Lord, we know, oh God, that you are in control, oh God. Man is not in control, but oh God, you are in control, Lord. And Lord, at your word, oh God, this disease must flee, oh God, even at your might be glorified. In the master's name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning and praise the Lord to everybody. Praise the Lord to you and our virtual audience. We know that we're worshiping God in somewhat of a different way, but we just want to worship God wherever we are. We know that God's spirit is not confined to just this location.
your temple.
stream in the east sanctuary, in the virtual worship, whatever you want to call it this morning, for I heard it already declared that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And certainly we are free to worship the Lord. We certainly thank the Lord for the singers, amen, that are here this morning, the minstrels, amen, the psalmists and the minstrels that are with us this morning. And we just give God praise for his faithfulness unto us. I want to, before I get into the word of the Lord, I want to ask you and to admonish you, please, I saw them shoot it up on the screen, but please take your liberty, amen, and go and sow a seed into this ministry. You can do so at our website. Our web address is emmanuelnashville.org, as well as you're able to mail in to a P.O. box, amen, that you're able to sow your seed. Amen. Aren't you grateful this morning, amen, for the faithfulness and the goodness of our God? For God is great and he is greatly to be praised. I'm going to go ahead and get right into the word of the Lord. I don't desire to bore your patience, amen, as we would say in the old church, I got a long way to go and a short time to get there, but I believe the Lord is going to help us this morning. If you would, I want you to turn with me as you draw your attention to a very familiar passage of scripture as we look at St. John, the gospel according to John, in particular chapter number 8, reading verses 51 through 53, and then we will read verses 56 through 58. St. John chapter number 8, verses 51 through 53. Then verses 56 through 58. Father, we thank you now for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you this morning, oh God, for last night's lying down and this morning's rising. We thank you, oh God, as we've said before, a reasonable portion of health and strength. For we realize this morning, God, that it is in you that we live, we move, and have our being. Now, God, as we stand behind this sacred desk, I pray that you would endow me and anoint me afresh. Speak through me and use, oh God, this vessel of clay for your glory and for your honor. Lord, do it in Jesus' name. And I'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it, amen, amen and amen. St. John chapter 8, beginning at verse number 51, declares, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil, because Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, who maketh thyself. Then Jesus replies to them, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, everybody say, I am. That's what I want to talk to you, amen, from that subject this morning, simply the great I am. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I, certainly as I begin to look at these scriptures and we begin to draw our attention, amen, to the word of the Lord. I begin to consider and understand that outside of the Messianic Jews or Judaism, it seems as if the Jews have always had an issue or a problem with who Jesus was and essentially with who Jesus is. Uh, maybe perhaps I would be better stated by saying it this way, that they've always seemed to have a problem with Jesus because of who they perceived him to be. Believe that it is worth noting. 
morning, amen, that as we begin to consider even the importance of perception, uh, one of our writers, the contemporary artist by the name of Leonardo da Vinci states that all of our knowledge has its origins in our perspective. Man, another writer begins to declare that it is not what we look at that matters, but it is how we see what we see. And finally, amen, the writer declares that perception is real even when it's not reality. We must understand, brothers and sisters, amen, that one of the major components, as it were, when we consider perspective is, is that we must consider that human perspective is always different than God's perspective. I need to say that one more time. Human perspective is always different from God's perspective. I can hear the writer, amen, this is the prophet, amen, Isaiah, as he began to declare in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 55, verses 8 and 9, he says, God says, your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts. As high as the heaven is above earth, so are my ways above your ways. The reality, brothers and sisters, amen, is that when it comes to God, it is necessary, amen, and essential that God reveals unto us what it is that he is doing in order for us to garner a proper perspective. Matter of fact, man, when we talk about perspective, man, I, I would like to submit to us that there are three, at least three problems, amen, with the human perspective. Amen. Number one, the first problem with the human perspective is that our perspective is limited while God's perspective is unlimited. You remember, amen, in the book of Exodus chapter number four, man, it is there in verses 10 through 13 where we see uh, it is that Moses is pleading with God and he's telling God, amen, in so many words that I would like for you to change the assignment that you have for my life. Man, Moses is talking to God and asking God to change his assignment and his mission, amen, by which God has spoken to Moses and told him that I want you to go down into Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Well, it is the Bible declares that Moses begins to get gets into a conversation with the Lord and he begins to speak to the Lord and tell God, amen, all, amen, as it relates to his perspective about himself. In so many words, Moses, when he starts talking to God, he says something like, God, would that you would change my assignment because I don't want to be embarrassed and I sure don't want to embarrass your name. Amen. Moses, Moses, amen, is talking to God because he's looking at his own proclivity and insufficiency. But I like this about God because God off of what he can perceive and see with his eyes. But when it comes to God, God's look, not looking in that at the outward appearance, but God is looking to the core of the situation. Man, and so it is that God, he begins to speak to Moses concerning his perspective about Moses' inadequacy. And then God's looking different because what God says to Moses is, you don't have a problem, you just need some help. I need to pause for a moment this morning and tell somebody that based off of what you're seeing and possibly even the information that you're hearing, you don't have a problem. I hear the amen, the late R.W. Schambach, man, he used to declare when I was a small boy, he said, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. I wish somebody would just put that in the comment section this morning. Amen. Surely. Surely, amen, there's somebody in your vicinity or in your area that may need to be encouraged to understand that greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. So it is that God speaks to Moses about his perspective about Moses and the Lord says unto him most specifically, now therefore I want you to go and I will be with you and I will be with thy mouth and I will teach 
issue with human perspective is human perspective. Uh, it tends to be distorted uh, whilst God's perspective is very clear. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, amen. If we were to consider Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 16, uh, we see here, amen, that it is now Peter. Uh, amen. As the disciples have gathered with Jesus. Uh, and the Bible declares that Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, amen. You know the story. It was Peter that stood up. Uh, amen. With a clear understanding and revelation as to who Jesus is. Uh, this is not in my notes, but it's in my spirit right now. Uh, man, I feel the need to tell somebody that you need to know who Jesus is. Uh, amen. That I have the old song I just want you to put Jesus is one. We are the people that believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. He is the Father of all. He's the God of all. He's in us all, above us all, and working through us all. But somebody shout, his name is Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I can't get stuck there. Just speak a word. That's what he's doing this morning. 
to somebody. He said, if you would just speak a word, my daughter would be healed. Well, Jesus said, I'm going to come to your house, J. Iris. And the Bible, the Bible declares that while Jesus is on his way to J. Iris' house, somebody else is in need of a miracle. Thank you, Lord. Somebody else is in need. They're in need of a miracle. The Bible informs us there's a woman in a crowd that's had an issue for 12 years. And her issue is very substantial because her issue is an issue of blood. I don't know about you, y'all, but when you got an issue that's an issue of blood, it is a sign that that life being lost. So she had a real life issue. And the Bible declares that she presses her way and touches the heel of his garment. And she gets healed. Now, Brother Chris, I've been thinking in the middle of that healing crusade, in the middle of that healing service, a great shout would jump out. A great shout would be heard in the crowd. But the Bible declares that while Jesus is talking to the woman about her healing, word comes in the middle of the healing service that now not only is Jairus' daughter sick, but she has expired. My Lord, we got a situation now. My Lord, because now, amen, you are on your way. And the Bible declares, amen, that the servant of the nobleman, J. Iris, he said, there's no need for you to trouble Jesus now. Amen, because the situation is past fixing. There's no need for you to worry Jesus now because all hope is gone. But I just rose up this morning to tell somebody, I hear the Lord now sing. Tell them don't worry, just believe. I know what we're facing right now. It's not like anything we've ever seen before. But we are serving the great I am. I don't want to put the cart before the horse now. But I need to tell somebody that if you don't have any problem, you just got to have faith in God. Would you take somebody, tell somebody, don't worry, just believe. Thank you, Lord. She's already dead. Jesus says to them, hey, don't worry about it. He says, I'm going anyway. And the Bible declares that when Jesus gets there, he walks into the room. Everybody's standing around looking at the situation. Everybody's crying about their loss. And the Bible declares that Jesus says to them, why are you crying? She's not dead. She's sleeping. Well, because they had a distorted perspective, the Bible said that they scorned him. They laughed him out of the room, as it were. But the Bible declares that Jesus goes in. He goes in and raises the daughter up out of her situation. In other words, her condition was over. Cancer. 
cancer tries to strike my body, he will preserve me. He will preserve me. When I get a pink slip and don't know where my next meal is coming from, he will. He will preserve me. I can hear the writer declare he will keep that which you commit into his hand against that day. Somebody shout, he will preserve me. Saying 
to the church. I ain't got time to deal with all of this. But John's message, the sign of the miracle, the message that John is carrying, my God, is that Jesus, he is the great I am. Thank you, Lord. He is the great I am. My God, I can prove it real quick. We find in the book of John, the seven I am statements of Jesus. In John chapter number six, verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter number eight, verse number 12, he says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verse 7, he says, I am the door to the sheepfold. In John chapter 10, y'all get what I'm saying. In John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. In John 11, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John chapter 15, verse 1, thank you, Lord. He says, I am the truth. I in other words, I need y'all to understand that I am everything. That's what it means when he said that I am. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the truth. Jesus wants us to understand today that he is everything. My God, when your mother and your father forsake you, when family cannot be there, he is everything. I'm excited this morning because I realize that he is everything to me. I don't know where I would be without the Lord. I can hear the old church say, when I look around and I see all that the Lord has done for me, I don't know what I would do without the Lord. John tells a seven statement about the great I am. And then John pulls out seven signs, seven signs in particular. And these signs are strategic. My God, in their order, John pulls out seven signs or seven miracles in relationship to salvation. Thank you, Lord. Let me prove it. And I'll get ready to get out of here. John pulls out seven strategic signs or miracles. These are used to prove the deity of Christ. My God, the first three signs show us how salvation has come unto sinners. For in John chapter number two, he says eternal water in the wine. This is a picture of salvation. That salvation comes by the word of God. For I hear the writer declare, how can they call upon him whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach except he be sent? I can't get stuck right there, but I need you to understand that turning water into wine it shows us that salvation comes by the word. John 4, chapter number 4. He healed the noble man's son. That shows us that salvation, it comes through faith. For we are saved by grace through faith. Because we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as being the great I am. John chapter number 5, it shows us the healing of the paralytic. Thank you, Lord. And the healing of the paralytic, it shows us that salvation comes by grace. I told you, John pulled out seven signs that spoke to us about salvation. I'm almost there. Well, the next four don't deal with how salvation 
salvation come to sinners, but it deal with how salvation or the results of salvation to the believer. For in John chapter number six, he fed the five thousand, and it shows us that when we get salvation, salvation brings satisfaction. John chapter six, verse sixteen, he steals the storm.